Welcome to Gardens Buffalo Niagara's Garden Pro interview. This segment is Native Plants, How to Get Started with Ken Parker and myself, Cassandra Sewell from Pelion Garden. Um, I'd like to start off with Ken's bio. Ken Parker is a CNLP, NGICP, and it, it's a horticultural industry. He's a horticultural industry champion, a passionate indigenous horticulturalist and member of the Seneca Nation of Indians. As a New York State certified nursery landscape professional and a national certified green infrastructure program trainer. He is one of 21 NGICP trainers in the US and the first in New York State providing hands-on education and the opportunity to participate in a nationally recognized standard that promotes exceptional job knowledge and skills to build, inspect, and maintain green infrastructure systems. Additionally, Ken offers extensive and diverse experience in horticultural systems, plant cultivation, propagation protocols, plant production procedures, and integrated pest management strategies. Ken has spent decades of his life devoted to growing, installing, teaching, and promoting the indigenous plants of North America. He has proactively participated in various environmental projects, including conservation, restoration, corporate landscaping, green infrastructure, education, marketing, and consulting through the United States and Canada over the past 25 years. So, um, I did listen to the webinar that uh, you participated in earlier um, this summer about uh, native plants. And I think there's two questions I sort of have um, right off the bat, which obviously, you know, what is a native, but then also, um, you know, what does it mean to be training people in these type of certifications? Okay, first of all, hello, how are you? <laughs> it's good to see you <laughs> in these times. Uh, well, let's tackle one at a time. Uh, let's, let's talk about what's native and, you know, I have a simple definition. Uh, you know, you can pull up the slide here, the first slide uh, about, uh, you know, what is a native plant? And, and I consider plants that are indigenous to where you live before European settlement. Uh, so that's what I'm considering native. Um, to, to me, the certifications are important, uh, again, with uh, green infrastructure which are rain gardens, uh, stormwater management. Uh, it's a national standard. Um, and it's a, it's a way for us to identify nomenclature uh, using materials and uh, how we construct, how we maintain them, how we install uh, a national standard for, uh, for our workers, our skilled workers. Um, so it's a new green job we're creating. Um, the CNLP, which is a New York State initiative, is uh, uh, just showing that uh, we're at a professional level as uh, landscapers and nursery people and and uh, we maintain that uh, professional level for clients and uh, people in the industry yeah. so that's native plants and i guess i want to talk a little bit more the next slide here about uh, doing various projects is uh, you know understanding where you live and and uh, the plants that are appropriate to where you live. We should be growing the plants uh, from the region where uh, you are. Those plants are from that region and generally are, uh, well, I shouldn't say generally, are successful without our help uh, if you're growing the, the plants from where you live. Um, it's a different type of uh, landscaping philosophy that I use. Uh, the next slide I use, it's uh, called uh, eco-landscaping or, or sometimes we say eco-logic. And uh, it's a different uh, mythology. Uh, it's, a, it's a different way of thinking. And, and uh, with the plants that we use, we let the site dictate the plant material. So the back, your backyard, if it's a project or your school garden, we go do a site visit. We look at the conditions, the soil conditions, uh, uh, the moisture that uh, the soil can maintain, and also the sun exposure that it gets. And that will tell you what kind of plants that you can grow there. So uh, that's how we're landscaping, using local indigenous plants and uh, letting the, the uh, site dictate the plant material. Yeah, um, I do think that is a huge um, sort of, you know, struggle that gardeners have, especially in cities, you know. On the one hand, we inherit sort of the garden that came with the house or, you know, in other situations, uh, with, if it's a new build or something, they completely clear whatever was there and then start from, you know, a blank slate. And then they, you know, residents tend to wonder like, well, why isn't this plant thriving? Or why do I get this huge puddle, you know, in the middle of my yard? And I think um, we, lo we lost sort of that natural, you know, what was there 
you know, that was maybe solving those, some of those problems. Um, and, and I think sometimes we wind up creating different problems. So I think this, this approach, it does seem, you know, logical. Um, it's just, we're not, we're not aware of it or, you know, we don't, we're overwhelmed by w what we encounter. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned when we, uh, when we landscape, we build, we clear the area, you're right. And then we go in and we plant uh, Austrian pine, uh, Japanese yew, Norway maple, you know, and I, I think about those names, where do you think those plants came from? And we're not right. really, it doesn't really represent the flora image of the region. You know, right. those plants are from here and I think it's important. And you and I had a conversation, phone conversation a couple of days ago, we talked about, uh, you know, we like to travel and uh, I work with other uh, uh, people in different regions on native plants. I, you know, and I get off the airport in the, in Denver at the Rocky Mountains, I want to see Rocky Mountain plants. And then you had mentioned, right. no, we don't. We see burning bush, we see all those right. European and, you know, introduced plant species as part of the natural land. Well, not natural right. landscape, but it's the, the man-made landscape. Right. And, and it's funny too, because at this point, I, I hope that, um, you know, like if I go to South Carolina, am I going to see saw palmetto? If I go to, you know, Louisiana, am I, you know, am I going to see, if what I'm looking at is also native. I have um, family that live in Houston and uh, in Austin and, you know, throughout Texas and, and there are palm trees in Houston now. And I'm, you know, I don't remember seeing them when I was a kid. I remember seeing like mesquite and things like that. Um, and so I don't know if, if what I'm looking at now is, is native or if it's something else that, you know, they brought in because it's another plant that is easy to take care of for, you know, for a city to take care of, for municipalities to, to deal with. So it's, it's really, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, confusing or seems like we're, we're creating problems all over the place, you know, um, thinking that we're doing solutions. I think we have to re-educate ourselves and put up yeah. the next slide, you know, going back to the, about the site uh, dictating the plant material, you know, and I just have kind of a, uh, you know, if your backyard's a swamp, this frog says, well, then you should just grow swamp plants. And if your backyard is clay or sandy soil, then what we'd like to do is uh, create a habitat uh, uh, or a group of plants. Plants grow in association of each other, uh, plants for those to, to uh, uh, grow in those particular conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, have a look at the next slide here. <clears throat> so what we are talking about, uh, all the different plant material and re-educating ourselves, I, I think about, in my mind, there's two types of indigenous or native plant projects. One is where you live, restoration, and, and in this case, you know, I always ask people, you know, the question, where do you think a Rocky Mountain Columbine is from? You know, it's not a trick question. It's you know, it's from the Colorados. Uh, so it's Rocky Mountain Columbine, a North American wildflower. And it right. is, it's a North American species. It's native to North America. But is it native to where we live? And uh, right now we're both in the uh, Western New York region. It is not native here. Mm -hmm. However, using a Rocky Mountain Columbine might be appropriate if uh, we're downtown Buffalo. Uh, it's a raised concrete planter. It's windy there, it's dry. Maybe that plant we planted in there to solve a landscape problem. So right. I like to call that using an, a North American plant beautification, whereas using uh, the uh, Eastern Columbine in a, say, a meadow planting, uh, we consider that restoration because it's from here. Right. And most importantly, we should be collecting local uh, seed. You know, the genetics of that plant should be collected locally from the Western New York region to be planted back into the Western New York region. Yeah. I, I actually would like to touch on this a little bit too, um, because in, you know, with all good intentions, when we started Pelion Garden, um, you know, I was looking for lists of native plants and, um, you know, Riverkeeper, Waterkeeper had a list that was published, you know, a decade ago. And in communicating with the sponsor who was helping us purchase plants for Pelion, um, you know, I wrote down, um, what was it? Um, spice bush, right? Because that was what was on the list for um, Riverkeeper, right, at the time. And, um, and they gave us spice bush from, you know, the nursery, right? And, you know, not knowing the scientific name for it, the Latin name for it, you know, we went ahead and planted it. And it turns out it's this gorgeous, wonderful Carolina allspice. 
spice oh. bush. You know, it's not the Lanacera with the, you know, the yellow um, flowers and berries and stuff that, you know, lives more like towards a wetland. So, you know, we, we kind of fall into this, you know, uh, I don't know if the correct word is mistake or not, but, you know, we fall into this situation where in communicating with nurseries and with the environmental scientists, you know, who are, who are trying to help us, you know, solve these problems, we still kind of make these kinds of mistakes, you know, I think. Um, we do obviously see pollinators and stuff visiting the, the Carolina allspice, but, um, but it's, it's, you know, I worry, like, should I be ripping this out? I mean, it's not spreading, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe we can touch on that a little bit more, like, you know, the, the, the situations that we encounter um, trying to get the correct plants, you know, for the region from the nurseries or from, um, you know, websites and things like that, where, where we might not know that there is this, you know, very subtle, like, difference for, for, you know, it's native to, I guess, the East Coast or the Northeast, but it's not really native to, um, you know, the Great Lakes in Western New York, so. So the industry is uh, struggling a bit. You know, I've been involved, uh, when I worked in Canada, um, back in the early 90s, uh, there was a handful of uh, North American uh, I, nursery specializing in North American species. I, I was one, uh, one of those nurseries and uh, now they're pretty advanced. There's lots of nurseries. Uh, Western New York in this particular region and New York State, you know, there's still just a handful of true, what I consider true uh, native nurseries or nursery selling, but you know, specializing in native plants. Mm -hmm. um, and within the industry in the region here, there's uh, the trade, you know, there's nurseries that carry some native plants. Right. Uh, you know, mostly commercial plants. And uh, to me, and, and I'm a purist, so, you know, I have a strong opinion. Uh, I'm a former Marine, you know, I sometimes I, uh, I'm a straight shooter for, uh, you know, I, I speak my mind and uh, that doesn't go over well with some nurseries. And uh, I like the local species and, and you're right, when you go to buy things, sometimes they're not locally uh, or they're introduced or they're cultivars of native plants, which we, we call native ours, and we can have a good discussion on that. Mm -hmm. um, but where it's coming around, you know, there's people now uh, very concerned about it. Uh, more natives are becoming available, but it's still a spattering within the nursery trade. And you're mm -hmm. right, we can get people all excited, but it's hard to find uh, some of the natives. And the spice bush that I think about is a uh, Lindira, which is native to this area. Right. Uh, so I'm not really sure what they gave you, what was the yeah. plant, but Carolina allspice is a great plant, but it's yeah. North American, but not really native to New York State. Right. You know, great plants. I, I, yeah. I often joke, I'm not a plant racist. I love all plants. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is a good one, but, but yeah, that's what I realized as I was, per you know, because um, the uh, Erie County Soil and Conservation, you know, they send out a, a brochure every season with a list of stuff. And as I was looking, you know, at the, the list of offerings, um, you know, they don't always use the scientific name. And so, you know, I went online and I do a Google search for, you know, you know, spice bush. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not what we planted, you know, but what we yeah. planted was also called spice bush because it was the common name, you know, one of the common names. Right. So, so yeah. And, and then I look and I see that, you know, well, uh, spice bush that's local, you know, to Western New York needs moist, well-drained soil. Well, that's not going to work at Pelion, you know, so so, you know, I didn't choose the spice bush that we chose based on, you know, um, necessarily like where it was going to go. But now I know that like I shouldn't purchase spice, the spice bush that's native, you know, to um, Western New York for the conditions that we have at Pelion because we, we have to water, you know, we don't have a moist area, right. you know, we don't have that situation. But somebody else in Buffalo who has a moist situation, hey, you should look into spice bush. <laughs> Yeah. Well, now, now it becomes important to understand the botanical Latin, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of like a pharmacist. You got to use the scientific name to get exactly, exactly what you want. And, you yep. know, there's yep. a little miscommunication. I have a slide. We should talk about native ours and uh, okay. go to the next slide, please. So um, cultivars and variety, uh, you know, a cultivar is a plant that you're really growing for a specific characteristic, whether it's you know, the petals have polka dots, or if it's a dwarf variety. And what's interesting, cultivars can only be reproduced by vegetative cuttings, basically cloning. Um, and then the new terminology we call native plants that are cultivars, we call them nativars. So uh, um, 
and variety is a plant that basically uh, will come true uh, most of the time from seed, whereas a cultivar will never, usually reverts back, won't come true from seed. And, and cultivars could be plants that are, that used to be native, but now all the foliage is purple. A good example is nine bark, where we have all those fancy nine barks. And uh, I just find it interesting how uh, man, you know, nursery, we, we, can always, we always think we can make better plants. And yeah, they're beautiful, but nature makes the best plants and nature sure. does it for nature. So um, that's the difference between a cultivar and a variety. Uh, again, varieties will uh, most of the time come true from seed. And, and there are some uh, interesting native varieties that do come true from seed, uh, a lot with red maples too. Uh, the next slide here, just talking a little bit more about the cultivars and, and uh, native ours. Um, I, this is my opinion, and some people will argue with me. I'm gonna, I still feel strongly that I don't consider cultivars native ours indigenous. Uh, however, they do merit some usage in home landscaping and, and uh, some native ours sometimes to solve a landscape problem. There's some great dwarf uh, uh, native ours that we can use in home landscaping. Because you know what, you know, if you live in the middle of the city, we can't rehabilitate that. It's already changed radically. You know, we can never go back to its true native state. However, cultivars and varieties, I do not recommend uh, to use in when we're doing real restoration plantings like natural areas, wetlands, uh, parks, roadside plantings, any kind of restoration projects would not recommend using cultivars or varieties. Right. So I don't know how you feel about that. I, I mean, I, I've seen, it's so tempting, you know, when you're at nurseries, you know, I, I come to it from not just a gardener, but you know, as an artist, um, I'm looking for color, texture, shape, and, you know, and as a little bit of a collector, you know, like it's when you see something and your eyes just like get all big and you're like, I need to grow that, you know, I want to see that when I, when I walk out of my front door in the morning, I want to see that, you know, down there in my health strip, you know, to, to, to make me excited. So it's, it's a real temptation. And I, I think, you know, a lot of it, like you said, it, the nurseries are trying to, um you know provide these things but but the fact is you know the the buyer needs to drive that um you know ability for the the market you know for the for the nurseries to like you know the more of us that are requesting it that are looking for these things um the the more frequently they're going to believe that they can support you know providing those uh plant materials and stuff so you said a term there you should define i, I like that you call it the hell strip Tell yeah. Us the strip so the hell strip is, I mean, you know, I'm not from Buffalo, but um, but it's the little strip of lawn that you're forced to mow um, here in the city of Buffalo. That's you know usually like 20 feet by five feet, yeah. and it's you know maybe your hose doesn't reach there, so and uh you know it gets damaged from snow and uh, salt and stuff like that when they're plowing, and um you know it's it tends to be dry or it tends to be you know really hard packed clay um and most people think the only thing they can grow there is grass but you know my um i hate grass so you know any situation i can switch a hell strip from uh grass to you know something that's more active um and doesn't require so much maintenance on my part and attention on my part the better you know so my hell strip is full of uh flowers that i initially got for free um, from people throwing out stuff or dividing things and slowly over time I've added you know things as I could afford to purchase things or as as people gifted me things or we divided and traded you know this is Buffalo it's a there's a huge DIY share culture you know so um, my my health strip is pretty colorful now um, and it's I don't ever have to mow it <laughs> so it's great but, oh, that's great I, I think about the health strip I think it's that little chunk of grass you said where between the sidewalk and the street right and I think about the summertime when that sun is beating down on the pavement and the sidewalk the concrete the heat uh you know mm -hmm. that little habitat is just you know horrendous mm -hmm. um yeah there's a lot of plants that can grow in that though if you yeah. again selecting yeah. the right plant material yeah I have yarrow I have um milkweed um I do have you know like I said I got I got some of these things for free. So I have the orange ditch lilies that, you know, everybody kind of has that I, I know are not native, but um, 
you know, and, and I have some other um, things just, just for, you know, the joy of it, um, you know, Asian lilies and stuff again, which are not native, but, um, you know, maybe don't spread so much. And, um, you know, I grow dill out there because A, it's easy and it feeds the swallowtail caterpillars, which in turn seem to feed the birds more than, <laughs> I get more birds than, than um, butterflies sometimes, but yeah, so. I that's throw great. some stuff in there that's, that's easy. The hell strip makes me think of an old classic rock tune. It's uh, I call it, I fought the lawn and the lawn won. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've bought a t-shirt for somebody that, that had that on there with a, with a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. And uh, I, I have a couple of plants that, uh, well, here's a resource, uh, especially for us in this area here in awesome. New York State. Uh, which is the uh, New York Flora Atlas. And if you just type that in, it'll, it'll send you to that link, you know, that site. And, and what you can do is click on the county, your county where you live, and we'll actually list uh, the native species of, of uh, you know, where you live and give you an idea. So it's an extensive list, but at least gets you in the ballpark and you could have checked on that uh, the Carolina allspice and you would have seen that it's not indigenous to Erie County where we are, but... Uh, so that's a great resource there, which is, uh, again, the New York Flora Atlas for people here in New York State and Western New York and Erie County and other counties. So next slide, please. So one of the ones, uh, and could do well in that hell strip, uh, you know, is uh, one of my favorites called bush honeysuckle. It's, uh, it's not a honeysuckle, but it's a uh, honeysuckle-like flowers, which is a dire villa. It's around three by three foot uh, yellow, pale yellow summer flowers. Uh, the new foliage is a little bit bronzy when it comes on, which is interesting. And uh, good fall color. Gets a nice burgundy fall color. Uh, the, the picture on the bottom there is I took that. That was actually at the Niagara Botanical Gardens. They were making an informal hedge. So this would be a great planting for uh, our plant for um, as a foundation planting around a house. Um, I would say does best in full sun, maybe half day sun, but does not tolerate shade. So you need kind of a sunny dry spot. Would do well in parking islands, uh, as well as that, that hell strip there. Again, uh, three by three foot uh, bush honeysuckle. And which, which uh, you know, pollinators would this benefit? Well, I, I would say, uh, you know, butterflies, mm -hmm. hummingbirds probably. It's got kind of a trumpet shaped bloom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a summer bloomer which is, you know, we need more summer flowering shrubs. Right, and, right. And indigenous to the area. I included the map, and it's interesting, the New York State Flora Atlas also has a map, and if you see the map on the bottom left of your screen there, it uh, lists the counties that it's, it should be found, commonly found. Wow, yeah. Yeah, next slide. Let's, let's see what else I, I brought, I, I can't remember here. Oh yeah, great dogwood. Uh, wow. you know, we use the red osier dogwood, but uh, this one here is a very common uh, shrub that we see along our roadsides. Can be a little big, six to eight foot, you know, not for small backyards, but very resilient. Uh, mm -hmm. Cornus species, Cornus frasmosa, uh, can grow in clay, uh, part shade, even a little bit of shadier, deeper shade spots, uh, uh, wet as well as dry soils. Um, you get uh, great flowers in early summer, followed by late summer, those beautiful white berries, which are inedible to humans, but the birds love them. And there's actually a point in late summer, uh, getting into September, where you get the berries with uh, the uh, burgundy fall color and a nice burgundy fall color. So when you're, you're driving around uh, uh, Western New York area in the fall, you'll see at the side of the road, and there's a good picture up on the right uh, of the nice burgundy fall color, gray dogwood. And I think a lot of gardeners, that's, that's also a question that, you know, I get a lot too, is, you know, the expectation or the desire for, you know, four season interest, you know, it's like, wow, you even want it to look good in the winter? Okay, let's, let's see what we can find. <laughs> so this one I think has, um, isn't the, the twigs, aren't they, don't they remain red or am I thinking of red twig dogwood? You're right. I, and it's, uh, the, I think they're called petioles, which are the, uh, the fruit uh, stems have a reddish color to them. And yes, when the birds finish that off and in the winter time, you get this nice contrast with the snow, this kind of red haze on it. And so yes, it does have winter interest for sure. And great, it's a great wildlife shrub for not only birds, but also in early summer pollinators on flowers and, mm. and bees. So great plant. Yeah, next slide, please. Again, pretty common where we live too in the Western New York area. Uh, this one's becoming readily available in the nursery trade, uh, yes. black oakberry, aronia. Uh, it's funny, Europeans have been growing this for a while, which is a North American shrub and native right. object to this area. 
for the berries, which are high, uh, show high antioxidant yeah. print, uh, uh, properties, excuse me. Yeah, this is, this is one of the ones that um, is my top three, you know, faves. And we grow this in Pelion and we actually have a chokeberry challenge uh, when the students come back in the fall. And, um, you know, we invite them to make recipes and, but we also create a soda with the, you know, chokeberries. And we use a little bit of, um, you know, we don't add sugar. We use natural Concord grape juice to, to be the sweetener. And the kids love it. And, and I see the picture of the fall foliage. I mean, the picture does not do it justice. This is an amazing plant for fall foliage. And the drama, the contrast between the dark berries and that, you know, um, reddish, you know, fire color is, is really amazing. And, and yeah, the, this is, this the is a top three. Yeah, for sure. The, the chokeberry itself, um, you know, a lot of people who aren't, you know, sort of don't have that practiced eye, they may go up to it um, and pick a berry off and pop it in their mouth, assuming that it's going to taste like blueberry and be sweet. And then they are hit with like this tartness that is like 10 times more tart than, you know, a raw cranberry. And, but it's, it's so much, you know, better for them. <laughs> and we have pictures of the students, you know, with the, um, uh, their fingers stained from, you know, when they're picking and, um, and crushing the berries and stuff. So I think, um, I wonder, you know, is this also, if you were doing a dye garden, this seems to be something that, you know, might be useful for dyeing fabrics and, uh, you know, Absolutely. yarn materials or something, you know, for, yeah. for that. I entirely yeah. have the berries for sure. And I've made jam with them too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the summer foliage we, we didn't talk about is a uh, glossy, shiny green leaves, which is interesting. Yeah. And about it's, five foot in height. Right. And um, the other thing about Aronia berry, I, I have seen, you know, there's, there's a couple spots in Buffalo that also have added, you know, this. Um, and I think there's also a red, um, I don't know if it's a variety or cultivar, you know, so. What's so an Aronia? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It is a, yeah. There's a native one. Yeah. Can and you let at the moment? <laughs> yeah. You, if you, if you were to add this to your backyard or your front yard or whatever, um, and, and, you know, eat the fruits and stuff, you can easily find recipes online. Just do, you know, aronia berry or choke berry recipes and make sure you, you do put in, you know, choke berry, not choke cherry, because it's, it's a big difference. But, yeah. um, as you said, it is super popular. There's a lot of German recipes I found for adding it to granola and muffins and muesli and, and stuff like that. So it, I love this one. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's uh, aronia brunitissimo, or I think it's the red, red choke berry. Yeah, I can't okay. remember. Um, next slide. We'll, we'll go to the next. This is a great plant, though. Mm -hmm. uh, St. John's wort. I like these are the native St. John's wort. Okay. And you can see it's limited to Niagara County, uh, uh -huh. but great plant for again parking islands. The Hell Strip uh, can take dry conditions, sandy conditions. Uh, the Calm St. John's wort, Hypericum calmianum, is uh, smaller, like three by three foot. I would I would say the foliage is kind of a bluish green. And then you get those summer uh, bright orange yellow flowers. Uh, the other one is shrubby St. John's wort, which is uh, Hypericum prolificum, a little bit larger, four by four foot. But uh, uh, these are great as foundation plantings or in mass. And again, mm -hmm. would be great in uh, parking islands or the health strip. So resilient uh, shrub. Um, and I believe was herbally used medicinally. You probably know more about that than I do. I, I mean, I know, I think St. John's wort is used as like a, oh, I don't want to misspeak. So yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think that also it's limited quantities. Like it's not something you should be taking like every day. Um, I want to say, I thought it was for enhancing like a little bit of depression. Um, yeah, I thought but, too. Yeah. But again, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't want to misspeak. Maybe a so. tea plant. I will have to look it up. Yeah. 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 Next slide, please. Comptonia, I really like this wow. one. Fragrant, very fragrant. I, foliage my, plant. my artist's eyeballs are just throbbing with this one. This one is so cool. So it's a shrub, it's not a fern, but again, it has a, it's a mm -hmm. nice foliage. Um, again, four by, you know, this is a bit of a spreader depending on the situation. If you had mm -hmm. sandy soil, um, I would use this as a ground cover shrub resilient right. in again parking lot islands you know those i don't know why we always plant grass in parking lot islands that's like the worst thing and crab apple trees <laughs> yeah we ridiculous. could do maybe a like an informal hedge of comptonia which is sweet fern uh this is a tea plant by the way 
So cool. you can make an informal tea with this. And uh, you can see where it's located in the region here in the Western New York area, Cantona Sweet Fern. Are you familiar with this one? Very fragrant. You know, no, you I've, this, is, this is news to me. So I'm, I'm writing it down. <laughs> Yeah, Cantonia. I really like this one. Uh, just uh, getting a little bit into the nursery trade. Um, huh. We keep using it in projects and uh, it's a, it can be a spreader, you know, you got to watch, uh, but we'll take heart. You know, this is one of those plants you could put in, I call it tough love. Put mm -hmm. it in those hell places and the hell, you know, the hell strip and it, it would just go all by itself. Yeah. Great plant. So I'm wondering too, as we're, you know, talking about this, um, you know, with, with the name of it, this common name of sweet fern you know foraging is huge in western new york um and i know a lot of people go out you know late spring looking for the fiddleheads and things like that um i mean i i don't think i've ever seen this out when i'm you know at the county parks or um you know even the state parks and stuff like that um so you know wow i i just yeah i i don't think i've seen this i know i've seen other types of fern, um, but but this was this is brand new. I would I would recognize this. So I think not a fern I've seen it out on a hike. And yeah. you would find it. It naturally occurs probably in sand plains or uh, okay. areas that were more sandy, maybe closer to the lake. Okay, okay. You know, that's where you would find that. That's where it naturally occurs. You know, I've been to Canada. Um, it grows naturally in the Canadian Shield. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, those uh, places where not much soil, uh, but prolific when you see it it's just huge patches it's really really great plant hmm. interesting yeah yeah let's uh let's have a look at the next slide here uh, you know i threw my bergamot in there i i really love the native indigenous wild bergamot which is a uh, yeah. spilosa uh but it, people forget it's a, not only a great pollinator but it's a great kitchen herb so the springtime, if you look at the stems carefully, you can see that the it's a uh, square uh -huh. uh, so remember the mint family so you can make tea with that during the summer months, right now, it's just starting to come in, in July in, in its bloom. You can see the beautiful pale lilac flowers. That's the native species. Um, you can use the fresh stems, leaves, or flowers uh, as uh, uh, an oregano substitute. Wow, um, yeah. And late, late summer, when it goes to seed, interesting, there's a, some kind of chemical change in the plant late summer. You know, when you're canning your tomatoes, um, it gets a, the leaves get a kind of a hot flavor, spicy. So we can probably add that to, uh, to your salsas. But what a great kitchen herb. And uh, Native Americans have been using this plant for forever. Uh, mm -hmm. There's different monardas from different regions as a seasoning. Yeah. So wild bergamot. Yeah, this one is, I love it for its drama, but also for, you know, all the, all the creatures that come and visit this. If, if you find a garden that has, you know, swaths of this, like five feet, you know, wide by like three feet or something, it, it really is dramatic and, and um, I've seen uh, definitely butterflies, but um, what's that? The hummingbird moth. Um, yeah. moth the first hummingbird. time I ever saw that in my life was like three years ago, and I was with one of my, one of the gardeners that I work with, and um, and she was asking me what that what, what it was, and I was like, I have no idea, but we can find out. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. so it really does best in full sun, full sun okay. eight. When I say full sun eight plus hours, when I say part sun, I'm usually saying six six to eight hours of sun exposure. Anything less than six hours of sun exposure in your backyard, I consider it a shade garden, just so we're mm -hmm. on the same page. Yeah. Yeah, next Great. slide. <clears throat> and uh, uh -huh. Penstemon, I love smooth Penstemon. Uh, this yes. is an early summer bloomer. Um, and what's great, Penstemon turns burgundy in the fall time. So this is great yeah. for hummingbirds. Uh, just finishing up its blooms right now in July, uh, but uh, great trumpet shaped blooms around, I want to say around the three foot range in height. Uh, it's mostly the stems and flowers, and then you had that uh, basal forage, foliage at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, will grow in a variety of conditions. I've seen this in part shade, half day sun, as well as full sun. Um, I would put this in the middle to the back of the border uh, yeah. just for interest until you know we, your summer stuff. So, yeah, we grow this one at Pelion, and I can, I can tell you. You know, if you want winter interest, you know, if you want fall and winter interest, this this lasts and it also reseeds pretty easily. So you can create, you know, a real border of this if, if you want. And yeah, it there are other varieties of, of Penstone, obviously, too. There's, you know, I've seen ones that are red, but but this one, um, you know, the the fall interest is 
it looks like you have a little ember, you know, uh, campfire embering, you know, right in front of you um, because it goes from that orange down to, you know, purple. And in the spring, the foliage is that, that same, you know, dark maroon color that you see. So it's, it's really distinct, you know, you, you can remember where you put it, um, you know, by, by its color and stuff, so, yeah. Well, the native R of, that's most commonly available is called Husker Red, is the, yeah. you know, yeah. Pensum and Digitalis, Husker Red is, mm -hmm. uh, so it has burgundy foliage all year round. Mm, yeah. I like the native, I just like the, the, I'm a purist, I like the original yeah. one. Yeah. Let's uh, have a look at the next slide here. So I put some grasses in there. I think we should put more grasses in the garden. This is for shade, uh, uh, Eastern bottle brush. I love that look, something you could cut and bring in and use in dried arrangements. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of city gardens, urban gardens have dry shade. You know, they have yeah. a big tree in their backyard or, or a big maple and it's tough to grow things in there. Whereas uh, Eastern bottle brush will do very, very well there. It's around the three foot range. And, you get those uh, those uh, seed heads probably late summer, uh, August is uh, when you'll, you'll see those. Uh, maybe late July, early August. Cool. Next slide. One of my favorites, we're starting to use a lot of sedges in our shade gardens. I love the big leaves on this, which is plantain leaf sedge. Uh, a short one could be used as a ground cover grass. Ah. Uh, the dry leaves are very, very interesting. Uh, so I, I have a question, you know, sure. just this is a problem that we have and, and I'm sure a lot of other gardeners have in Buffalo, Bishop's Weed, you know, we have a, a shade garden um, that's somewhat dry and it is, the Bishop's Weed is, you know, just taken over. Um, it's really hard to combat it with anything. Um, we have some you know, the wild geranium, um, and I'm, I'm getting a little frustrated, you know, because it's, it's now starting to encroach on the wild geranium, which kind of was separated for several years. And so, um, you know, a, apart from torching the bishops, we, you know, the soil, the everything, you know, that it's in, um, would this be something that we could plant to compete with that bishop's weed? Yeah, bishop's weed is, uh, can be a bully in the garden. <laughs> I know people like to say invasive, uh, but it's very aggressive. And yeah. I'm not a big fan of bishop's weed. And I think that we have a lot of natives that uh, we could pull that bishop's weed out and put some plantain leaf sedge in there. You mm -hmm. got a great idea with the uh, wild geranium. I would use Virginia bluebells. Okay. Uh, uh, wild ginger would be a great one. Uh, Pennsylvania sedge would be a great plant in there, foam flower. So those are all great Very plants, awesome. uh, great plants to put in there in place of that. Um, you know, you got to be careful. Ostrich fern would, you know, compete with that, but that could be uh, tall, too tall sometimes right. for some of those shade spots. Hay Center would do well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, even uh, wild blue phlox is native to this area. Okay. I, I consider much better ground covers than the bishop's wheat. So. Yeah. Um, if available and it's hard to find may apples, I love may apples, they're great too. And they yeah. look like a uh, little, form a little colony and, and uh, look like big maple leaves on the ground. So cool. those are alternatives. Uh, I think I give a, let's look at the next slide. So uh, some lists of some of the shade plants. And so, uh, you know, for dry to medium soils, which is most urban gardens, you know, we don't have a forest like situation. Forest is because all those leaves keep falling down there. It's, it's loam, which means it's rich, it's moist. Our backyards are dry. So mm -hmm. I named Virginia Blue up. Barren strawberry, I forgot about them. That's a great plant. Uh, also ground cover, tall thimble weed, uh, white snake root, wood mint, uh, you know, if you could find it. And, and asters, we need to use more asters in the garden. They bloom in the fall time. Large leaf aster, heart leaf aster is great. Uh, mm -hmm. also in the shade garden and include goldenrods. You know, blue stem goldenrod is a great shade one. And know that I've had many arguments with people. Goldenrod does not cause hay fever. Uh, it's ragweed. Right. Goldenrod pollen is oily. It's only insect pollinated, guilt by association. Right. Uh, goldenrod, very important to the, the late summer and fall pre-winter pollinators who, you know, need that last bit of food just mm -hmm. before winter. So we should include goldenrods in our, in our gardens. The next slide is for people who are fortunate to have more rich soil, you know, nice, where we can do trilliums, wild leeks, you know, ramps are great. Yeah. Um, 
and we need to do more violets in the garden. Violets are edible, um, mm -hmm. and they're great ground covers for that. May, I mentioned mayapple bloodroot is a great one, uh, Canada anemone, bellwort, uh, and there's a milkweed that grows at the edge of the woods, which is a Western New York native. Uh, we're working on that here at the English Gardener. I have uh, some parent plants. I hope to have seedlings next spring, which is uh, Asclepius exaltata, poke milkweed. Spike mm -hmm. nard, a great three by three foot plant for shade gardens and uh, and I, I already mentioned uh, large leaf aster. So more asters in the garden. For sunny sites, you should use New England aster, which is a staple dark purple flower, uh, great pollinator and, mm -hmm. and great Western New York aster for gardens. And again, asters bloom probably late August, September, and sometimes well into early November. So asters mm -hmm. are a great addition in gardens. So I just have probably a couple more slides. Yeah, I wanted to do just a little plug about rain gardens. We're doing a lot of work uh, with the city of Buffalo on green infrastructure here. Uh, we're training our workers. And uh, the idea is for people to disconnect their downspouts from the gutter, instead of going into the stormwater drains, which are becoming inundated, inundated uh, during rainstorms, uh, we're directing it into gardens. And it's a specialized garden. Uh, you know, if you're gonna do a rain garden, it's important to know it's gotta be 10 feet away from the house. You don't want that water coming back. And we're using a specialized soil, which we call uh, biomedia rain garden soil. Uh, the national standard, I know the slide's a little different. It's 50% sand, 50% compost. Uh, we put plants in there, and despite what people think rain gardens, um, rain gardens are mostly dry. They're only wet when it rains, and the right. idea is that we're capturing that water, and we're letting it, just like nature intended, instead of hitting the pavement going into stormwater, we're putting it back and infiltrating back in the ground. And right. there's lots of plants that can grow, and we're using native plants as pollinators. You can put edible plants in there uh, from your roof to your rain garden. I, I want to be careful with edible plants because if we're using it off the streets or parking lots, probably don't want to eat the stuff that's, uh, you know, because we're, we're also collecting debris, and uh, sometimes there's chemicals and, and autos go into that. But this is a great filtration system not only get the water get the water back in the ground, but also to get some of the impurities out from our parking lots and let mm -hmm. the plants do their work. So just a little bit touching on what green infrastructure is and why it's important that we use rain gardens and sometimes mm -hmm. we call it bio swells, important in the landscape and uh, contributing to the environment, positive contribution to the environment. Yeah, love it. We have, right. we have a you know rain garden at Pelion in that they, you know, before I came on board, they uh, regraded the entire four lots worth of land so that everything that falls on it, you know, goes toward the rear of the garden and we um, built up a berm in the back. And so most of what we've planted in that area, um, we've got service berry, we've got, um, you know, milkweed, drought tolerant plants, um, but, you know, what was there already underneath, you know, the, the surface was, the, you know, these maples and, um, and the the bishop's weed so i'm slowly trying to replace the the bad stuff with more of the stuff that would really thrive in that rain garden situation you know yeah I, obviously in the middle the lowest part of the rain garden, we could put that wet stuff on the mm -hmm. outer edges you could probably get away with more dry or, mm -hmm. or uh you know measing dry species so mm -hmm. i think about have maybe one or two more slides and uh yeah, I think it's important for me, native plants, what we're trying to do is restore the flora of that region. We're trying to preserve it and maintain those. You know, we have to remind ourselves that native plants in the landscape are like native people. Um, they're in the minority now. It's how, you'd be hard pressed to find uh, a New York State, you know, where we live, a New York State plant on the side of the road and, you know, a few, but even in the city, most gardens do not have indigenous local species. And um, right. I always share the last thought about, uh, uh, it's a native philosophy from the, the Iroquois people that, you know, what we do now affects the next seven generations. And I think it's important that we use natives and we get everybody to put, hey, put a couple of native plants back in the garden. And I know you're doing great work at the gardens over there and doing natives. And uh, you're fortunate because I love teaching. I love kids. You're working with the kids. You're indoctrinating them and uh, you're teaching them why it's important to, to take care of the environment and, and what really belongs here, the flora of the region. Right. Well, and um, I don't know if, if your last slide is about the um, the collaborative, um, but I I did um, print up the the sign that the collaborative is like helping the um, 
you know, there's there's a lot of gardens uh, that are going to be participating in this on the garden walk, um, the East Side Garden Walk, the the normal garden walk um, that happens. And, and so this sign is out there. I know it's backwards for, for the screen, but it says, you know, native plants grown here. And the gardens who are using native plants are putting these signs near, you know, their pollinator buffets or, or these other areas in their gardens so that the, the public, the visitors um, can sort of pay more attention and focus in on, you know, okay, well, I like that. You know, I, I like the texture of that one, or I like the the blooms on that and and then they'll seek it out and again we'll build that um, desire for more native plants at the nurseries at, you know at the at the shops and things like that where people can get them and I don't know maybe we could do a native plant swap <laughs> in the future absolutely, you know absolutely I wanted to do a quick shout out to the uh, plant Western New York the Landscape Association uh, they made a donation so we could have those signs printed um, I'm very fortunate to work with uh, Linda Schlikoff. Uh, we co-founded the uh, Western New York Native Plant Collaborative and uh, we're very excited. The idea was to pool our resources so that we're all not trying to reinvent the wheel and uh, working together with local organizations, uh, City of Buffalo's involved, the Botanical Gardens, New York State Parks, uh, Erie County Environmental Planning Office. We're all trying to coordinate our efforts to uh, put more native plants back in the landscape. What a great organization, uh, our meetings. Of course, our meetings stop now because of uh, what's going oh, on yeah. uh, you know, in, the, in the world here, but uh, we are still staying connected. Um, we usually have, uh, there's over 100 members in our group. Uh, when we did our meetings, we averaged between 30, 45 people yeah. at the meeting. So there's such, I, I'm excited, the enthusiasm in the area and people like yourself yeah about uh, why it's important to put native plants back in the landscape and it's important to the environment. So yeah, yeah I'm glad you got a sign. I have to get one of those signs too. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that you guys are doing that because it, it's helping to, it's helping me educate um, not just the students, but you know, we have volunteers that come um, and parents and stuff and, and they, they, you know, are excited about what their kids get excited about. And with, with volunteers, when they come, you know, they're excited to be contributing something positive that lasts beyond them. You know, it's like, you know, they come and they do some pruning or they do some weeding or something that doesn't really feel like they're making much of an impact, but, but while they're there, they're absorbing and they're becoming more familiar with plants to look for in the future. And, and there's, you know, that little spark of pleasure when they recognize, Oh, this is button bush. I, I remember this, or this is fringe tree. I remember this. So, you know, or they get to taste the service barrier or something like that, you know, so a little at a time, hopefully people are taking it away and, and, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna spread and we're gonna, you know, hopefully um, repair some of, you know, the damage that we do over the decades, you know, with, with putting in grass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. But, yeah. Any last questions? Um, no, it's been great talking with you. Um, and I think that this is going to be posted tomorrow, uh, Tuesday. So, um, and yeah, so I just want to mention, you know, again, this is the Gardens Buffalo Niagara Garden Pro interview, um, Native Plants and How to Get Started with Ken Parker and Cassandra Sewell. Thanks. Great talking with you. You too. <laughs>